Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 1. In the past few videos, we've been looking at the velocities of gas molecules, and we figured out how to determine their average velocity, and also the distribution of their velocities. But why is that useful? Today, I want to show you how the large-scale behavior of gases and liquids can be determined by using some of the results we've gotten in the last two videos. Those phenomena include diffusion and viscosity, and we'll see that those have lots of practical applications. To begin, let's look even more deeply at the way gas molecules move and collide. Imagine that we have a molecule A, and it's moving in a straight line through a gas composed of the molecule B. Sooner or later, the molecule A will collide with one of the B molecules. When that happens, the distance between the centers of the two molecules will just be the sum of the radii of the two molecules. We'll call that distance d. Now, suppose we're sitting behind the molecule A as it travels through the gas. Imagine a circle with radius d around the molecule. In order for a B molecule to collide with the A molecule, the center of the B molecule will have to stray inside the circle. If it does, then the two molecules will touch each other when molecule A passes by. So, the region inside this circle represents the range of positions that a B molecule can be in in order to cause a collision. For that reason, the area of this circle is called the collision cross-section, and it has the symbol lowercase sigma. As you probably know from the geometry classes you took in high school, the area of this circle is pi times the radius squared. Since the radius of this circle is called d, we have pi times d squared. So, whenever a B molecule enters this circle, it will collide with the A molecule. That means that the larger the circle is, the more likely that collisions will happen, which increases the likelihood that there will be a chemical reaction. Let's stop here a moment and think about what kinds of things will increase the likelihood that an A and a B molecule will collide. First is the collision cross-section, which we just talked about. The larger the two molecules are, the bigger the collision cross-section, and the more likely it is that two molecules will hit each other. Another important factor that can affect the collision frequency is the number of molecules. We express that using a property called the number density. That's the number of molecules per unit volume, and we express it using this symbol, which is the Greek letter rho. So, how do we calculate the number density? Well, the easiest way is to determine the number of moles in a certain volume, and then multiply that by Avogadro's number to get the molecules in the volume. One thing to remember is that if we're going to use the number density in a calculation, we'll want the units to cancel out. Unfortunately, liters is not a unit that will usually cancel out in our equations, so we'll want to use cubic meters for the volume instead. That brings us to a very useful conversion factor. One cubic meter contains 1,000 liters. You should try to remember that conversion factor, because it'll come in handy in many of the calculations we do throughout the year. So, two factors that affect the collision frequency are the collision cross-section and the molecular number density. One last thing that matters is how fast the molecules are moving. And that's something we already know how to calculate. It's just the average velocity, which is this. It turns out that the collision frequency has the symbol z and can be expressed using this equation. The square root of 2 times the collision cross-section, the number density, and the average velocity. Let's try using this equation. Suppose we have a sample of water molecules which have an average radius of 2.00 angstroms. What is the collision frequency between the water molecules in a vapor at 400 degrees Kelvin and 1.00 atmospheres? We'll use this equation to find the collision frequency, so we'll need to calculate each of the three terms in the equation. Let's determine the collision cross-section first. Remember, the collision cross-section is pi times d squared, where d is the sum of the radii of the two colliding molecules. 
In this case, we're looking at collisions between two water molecules, so d is just the sum of each molecule's radius, for a total of 4.00 angstroms. We want the units to be SI units, so we should convert angstroms to meters, which gives us 4.00 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. When we plug this into the formula for the collision cross-section, we get sigma equals 5.0265 times 10 to the minus 19 meters squared. Next, we'll calculate the number density. As I mentioned earlier, this is equal to the number of moles divided by the volume times Avogadro's number. At first, it looks like we don't have that information, but actually we can use the ideal gas law to help us find the solution. We can rearrange the ideal gas law slightly by dividing both sides of the equation by V times R times T. If we do that, we find out that P over RT equals N over V. So we can plug that into our equation for N over V. Since P is in atmospheres, it makes sense to use the version of R that has the units of liters times atmospheres over kelvins times moles. If we do that, we get a result of rho equals 1.8346 times 10 to the 22nd molecules per liter. Remember, we want the units to cancel out, so we should convert liters to cubic meters. You might recall that there are 1,000 liters per cubic meter, so this changes our answer to 1.8346 times 10 to the 25th molecules per cubic meter. Finally, we need to calculate the average velocity. In this case, we have 400K for the temperature and 0.01801508 kilograms per mole for the molar mass of water. We need R, the gas law constant again, but this time we don't have any data with units of liters or atmospheres, so we'll use the other version of R, 8.314 joules per kelvin mole. When we calculate the velocity, we find out that it's 685.625 meters per second. So now we have all the data we need to calculate the collision frequency. When we do, we get a result of 8.315. 9415 times 10 to the 9. And what about the units? It turns out that all the units cancel out except for seconds in the denominator, so the unit is seconds to the minus 1. In other words, there are about 8.94 billion collisions per second. That's a lot of collisions happening in a very short time. In this example, as you can imagine, the collisions happen so often that any single water molecule doesn't travel very far before it collides with another molecule. Exactly how far does a molecule travel between collisions? That's a property called the mean free path, which has the symbol lambda. It'll be very useful in several equations that we'll use in the future. It's actually a fairly easy thing to calculate. We just take the average velocity and divide by the collision frequency. For example, if we look at the sample of water that we discussed just a moment ago, we have 685.625 meters per second for the average velocity, and 8.9415 times 10 to the 9 seconds to the minus 1 for a collision frequency. Plugging these into our equation for the mean free path gives us lambda equals 7.668 times 10 to the minus 8 meters. In other words, each water molecule can travel an average of 76.68 nanometers between collisions. That's not very far, much shorter than a wavelength of visible light. But remember that a water molecule has an average radius of 2.00 angstroms, so the molecules are able to travel in a straight line a few dozen times the width of the molecule itself. That's the reason that we usually say that a gas is composed mostly of empty space. Anyway, let's think about what this means for the path traveled by a typical molecule in a sample of gas. 
In the case of the water we were just talking about, the molecule travels an average of about 77 nanometers, then collides with another molecule. After the collision, the molecule travels in a new random direction. After that, the molecule travels another 77 nanometers on average, and then collides again, and that sets it off in a new direction. If we follow the path traveled by the molecule, it turns out that it takes a fairly long time for the molecule to actually move very far from the starting point, because it's colliding so often with other molecules. This type of path, in which the molecule often changes direction, is called a random walk. However, the molecule does eventually travel a fair distance from where it started, even though it's not in a straight line. So, molecules following a random walk eventually spread out through space, and this is the process known as diffusion. You've seen this before. If you do an acid-base titration using phenolphthalein as an indicator, you might have noticed that a drop of sodium hydroxide can cause a temporary pink color in the solution, which disappears when you stir it. However, if you don't stir or shake the solution, you'll notice that the pink color lingers and very slowly spreads through the solution. The pink indicator molecules are slowly diffusing through the solution thanks to a random walk that occurs when the indicator molecules collide with other molecules in the solution, mostly the solvent. Another good example of diffusion is the spread of the scent of perfume. You've probably had the experience of sitting in a room and having someone who's wearing too much perfume walk into the room. Depending on how far they are from you, you'll discover that the scent of the perfume reaches you either quickly or slowly. One factor that can affect the rate of diffusion is the viscosity of the fluid that the diffusing molecules are moving through. You're familiar with viscosity thanks to fluids like motor oil. Oil is a very viscous fluid, and we usually think of that as the thickness of the oil. Materials like maple syrup and honey are also viscous, while fluids like gases or water have a very low viscosity. Viscosity is the amount by which a substance resists flowing in a certain direction. So, why does that happen? Well, suppose we have molecules that are moving in the Z direction. When they collide, some of their momentum can be transferred into a direction perpendicular to the z-direction. As a result, flow in the z-direction is slowed down. So, for example, suppose the molecules are flowing in the z-direction, and they're moving past a wall that's parallel to the direction of flow. As a result of collisions between the molecules, suppose there's a molecule that starts moving directly toward the wall. Will the molecule actually hit the wall? Well, it depends on how close to the wall the molecule is. Based on our discussion earlier in the video, we know that the molecule will travel in a straight line until it has gone an average distance of about one mean free path, at which point it will collide with another molecule. So, if the molecule is within one mean free path from the wall, it will actually hit the wall. As a result, the molecule will transfer a little of its momentum to the wall, and that will slow the molecule down, which is what makes the fluid flow more slowly. So, the viscosity depends on the number of collisions that take place between the wall and the molecules in the fluid over a certain period of time. The theory behind fluid flow and viscosity is fairly complex, and it was one of the many problems that caught the attention of Albert Einstein. He helped to develop the theory behind viscosity, and one of the most important results he published was an equation that describes the viscosity of a fluid. Here's that equation. As you can see, the viscosity has this symbol, which is the Greek letter eta, and it depends on several properties of the fluid. First is the number density of the molecules. That makes sense, because the more molecules there are, the more often they'll collide. The mean free path is also important. Remember, the molecule must be within that distance from the wall in order to collide with it. So the longer the mean free path is, the greater the likelihood that a molecule will eventually reach the wall. 
M here is the mass of a molecule, so heavier molecules will be more viscous, which makes intuitive sense. Heavy molecules like oil tend to form more viscous fluids than light molecules like water. Finally, the average velocity also appears in the equation. Let's try using this equation. Earlier, we looked at a sample of water vapor and determined its number density, its mean free path, its mass, and its average velocity. Let's use those to find out the viscosity of the water. Notice that the mass we want here is the mass of one molecule, not the mass per mole. Therefore, we need to divide the molecular mass that we already calculated by Avogadro's number to get the mass of a molecule. Now, when we plug in these numbers into our viscosity equation, it turns out to be 9.618 times 10 to the minus 6 kilograms over meters times seconds. Well, that's enough new material for now. In the next video, we'll finish up this part of the course by looking even more deeply at the individual molecules in a gas, and we'll find out how the energy of the molecule is distributed into different types of motion. That's a topic that has a significant impact on spectroscopy, and it's something that'll come in handy in several other chemistry courses besides PCHEM. I hope you'll join me for that. But until then, have a good week!